Welcome, welcome everybody uh, to uh, the second annual uh, Hispanic Heritage Month uh, roundtable discussion. Um, we are so glad to be here again. Um, we have a, uh, a panelist uh, full of excitement, uh, and I'm very excited to introduce them. But as we all know, um, we are wrapping up our Hispanic Heritage Month uh, celebration here with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And um, what a better way to wrap it up than to really uh, celebrate all our uh, Hispanic and Latinos, Latinas, uh, peers that work for uh, state parks and Texas Parks and Wildlife, uh, and to really just, um, you know, discuss, examine uh, any type of uh, anecdotes, experiences leading up to their uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife careers um, and, and the current role that they currently serve in right now. Um, so, with that being said, um, uh, let's go ahead and welcome all the members of the panelists today, and uh, and uh, let's let's get into it. All right, I'm super excited to have everybody here today joining me, uh, celebrating this uh, second annual Hispanic Heritage uh, Month uh, panel discussion with uh, you know a good bunch of peers that I have here with Texas Parks and Wildlife State Parks. I'm I'm really excited to. To kind of highlight their careers and all their uh, their awesomeness when it comes to uh, everything that they do to provide uh, this excellent service to our visitors and in, in state parks. Um, so I really want to introduce myself. I am Edwin Quintero. I'm the park superintendent here at Goose Island State Park, and uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, I really enjoy what, what I do. We we really get to connect people to the outdoors, to the to camping, uh, first time uh, hikers or campers. Um, and so with that being said, I have been here at this particular location for roughly about uh, two years now. Um, and uh, it's it's been a great uh, um, experience working uh, for Tex Parks and Wildlife. Um, so I really want to highlight everybody and now, you know, can can everybody just start off and, and just introduce themselves where they are from, um, their current park or location that they're they're at, and, uh, and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Diego, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Sure. My name is uh, Diego Aragon. I am the park superintendent at uh, Joe Canyon State Park, and I've been here for almost two years as well. Awesome. Hey, Shelby, how you doing? Good, how are you? I am doing well. I'm so excited to have you guys here today. And uh, uh, would you care to just give us a little bit of, uh, of your background, uh, you know, who you are, uh, what do you do, uh, and how did you get to this current position that you're currently on right now? Yeah, for sure. So I'm Shelby Rodriguez. Um, I'm currently a college student, but I'm re representing Martin Creek Lake State Park as a um, ambassador. Um, I got this position kind of offhandedly. I was told by my professors I should apply and I was very hesitant because I'm like, surely there is somebody way more qualified than me to get this position. But I did it anyways, very last minute. And I got a call back and um, I did an interview and I got the position um, and I was really excited because I got the state park that I really wanted to represent the most, which was Martin Creek. It's my um, local state park. So I went to it growing up. Um, so I was very excited about that. And I've been serving um, at Martin Creek since past spring um, and I will be serving until um, pretty much the end of December. Yeah. That nice. Thanks. That's awesome. Yeah. Hey, Krista, how you doing? Good morning. Hey, good morning. Hi. Um, yeah. So my name is Krista Gonzalez. I'm the assistant park superintendent here at Lake Corpus Christi State Park. Um, I started my TPWD journey as a customer service representative at Choke Canyon State Park about a little over four years ago. Um, that's where I initially fell in love with state parks. I didn't really go into it thinking that this was what I wanted to do all my life. Um, but when I got into it, I was just like, oh, this is great. This is what I, this is it, you know? So um, for, for a couple of years, both at Choke Canyon and at Guadalupe River, I was the customer service representative. 
Um, and then I moved into a, a assistant office manager position at Palmetto State Park. And um, that's, I learned so much there. And that's where I kind of made the decision that I wanted to go or try to go into management for state parks. Um, and so after I made that decision, it, it took a while to find the right park to open up, but Lake Corpus Christi opened up a vacancy for assistant park superintendent. I was so excited and I jumped on it. And uh, so I'm here, I've, I've actually just been here for about four and a half months. So still learning every day, I'm still learning something new, but that's the exciting part. And um, I, I love this position. That's awesome. You know, you really never stop learning. It's always a, a, a lifelong uh, learning experience. And so uh, it's great. It's great. Awesome. Thanks, Krista. Uh, Rafa, could you uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, uh, you know, who are you? Uh, what, what do you do at your current position? And, and how did you come about uh, in that current role that you're currently in? Yeah, of course, Edwin. So uh, my name is Rafael Contreras Rangel, uh, but I, I go by Rafa. Uh, I'm the park operations trainee at the Franklin Mountain State Park uh, in El Paso, Texas. So um, something just different that some people maybe on the east side don't know, but like on the west side, all the way to the west of Texas, we're in the Chihuahuan Desert. So a lot of what people think of going outdoors, like kind of like the forest area, the lakes, the rivers, um, I mean, we, it's, pretty different over here. So it's it's where I grew up. And uh, actually, I feel like my background is really different compared to what a lot of people that you find in, this, in these positions, uh, like recreation outdoors. Uh, for me, I didn't really know about the environment that much, or I didn't really learn about it as much. Again, just because I grew up in a desert, and I feel like historically, deserts haven't been seen equally to other ecosystems, at least uh, value-wise. So I went all of my, uh, my younger years all the way up into college, like really not knowing um, what the environment was and why it was important. But anyway, uh, I used to be a swimmer. Uh, I went to college for swimming. That was kind of like my whole life. I was an athlete. Uh, and eventually, uh, due to some health reasons, I had to stop swimming in college. So I kind of had like a next existential crisis going on, like, what am I going to do now? So I was taking a lot of different classes just because I, I didn't really care much about academics either, but um, now I had to do something. And it actually happened that uh, the register messed up. I was gonna take the basic biology course because it was like just one of those courses I just need to take. So I took, I wanted to take the general course that was the easiest one, but then they messed up and put me in conservation biology. I ended up really liking it. It like opened up my whole world. I learned about the environment. I learned why it was important. I learned why I learned why we need to. Uh, it's almost gone, and we need to protect it. I'll get it back. But anyway, that's how I got interested in it. And then um, once I got back to El Paso, again being a desert, I feel like there wasn't as many opportunities here as in other places. So I actually had to go out of the state. So I went to Michigan to Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I started volunteering to get some experience. Um, there's a lot more, there's a lot of um, different organizations doing work. And I uh, just with volunteering, I got my step in the door with the local, with the uh, um, Ann Arbor uh, Natural Area Preservation. I got some experience uh, in a field crew, did controlled burns, uh, and then decided to uh, get back to water. Uh, being a swimmer, I was like, you know, I wanna like, do some water stuff. I want to be like lakes and rivers. So uh, overnight, I just decided to apply to. I, I kind of just do what's in the moment. I don't. I don't plan a lot. I just kind of jump from things to things. So I decided to get a master's at the University of Minnesota. I got my master's. Uh, worked for the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, I was able to scuba dive. Uh, I was uh, like on a boat in lakes every day. Uh, so it was great. Uh, I finished my master's and then I decided like, you know, um, I really want to go back home and kind of uh, give back to my community, uh, especially since I know that not a lot of people in El Paso kind of go in the route that I took. So I wanted to come back home and that's what I did. Uh, first I needed, there wasn't anything open in El Paso. So I went to the Bureau of Land Management. I was the assistant aquatic biologist there. Uh, it was a temporal position and then uh, while I was in that position, the park operations trainee uh, opened up. And uh, just the park operations trainee is, I think, is the perfect position for anybody that's looking to start with the state parks in general, mm -hmm. just because 
you're getting trained to be an interpreter, you're getting trained about being a superintendent, uh, maintenance. So I think I'm at the perfect place right now uh, to be able to grow now with the Texas Parks and Wildlife because I'll be able to choose kind of what I like most. And so I'm, I'm really glad I'm here right now. Hey, that that's awesome. And and I'll tell you something, you know, that location that you're in uh, right now, it's, it's a beautiful location. Um, you know, thankfully that register uh, person that may, uh, put you in that different class <laughs> led you in that right path I'll tell you that <laughs> oh yeah I've definitely found uh, the hidden beauty of the desert uh, yep. just looking at it through a different to a different lens and yep. uh, it's beautiful out here so I'm really happy that's awesome awesome hey Carolyn how you doing good morning Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Carolyn Gonzalez, the Director of State Park Staff Services and Administration. And we have the pleasure of helping parks and programs staff paid and unpaid positions. And it's great to see everyone here today who has, has had a long journey with parks and wildlife and been in several different locations. Um, my office is located in Austin at the headquarters. Um, and I'd love to have the park background because we are actually situated in McKinney Falls State Park. So um, right now you have Tyler State Park in my background, but I got here because I was in manufacturing and uh, staffing organizations during the late 90s and early 2000s. And we had a bunch of layoffs. And I said, let me get to a place where I have a little more security and out of management. So I came in at an administrative position, which provides an opportunity, like Krista said, to learn a lot about park operations and um, the park administration. So uh, fast forward a couple of years and I got promoted to my current position where we, like I said, serve our state parks and programs and help them uh, with mission critical goals and needs. I'm happy to be here today, thank you. That's awesome, Carolyn. Thanks, thanks so much for sharing that with us. Hey, Henry, how you doing, Henry? I'm pretty good this morning. Um, well, uh, to introduce myself, my name is Henry Rosales. I'm the assistant office manager here at Galveston Island State Park. Uh, I just started with the agency this June, so I'm about five months in. Um, I'm super excited because we just opened our park June 27th on the beach side. So there's been a lot of changes, a lot of adapting, and a lot of growing. But what's been great about this position is that I can kind of make it my own uh, as we're trying to establish what our standards are going to be. Um, I originally came out from outside the agency doing uh, taxes and insurance. So it's a giant leap from uh, doing stewardship. But I did grow up going, uh, doing a lot of outdoor activities, camping, fishing, hiking. Um, favorite part growing up was uh, Guadalupe River State Park. Um, since I'm originally from San Antonio, that was like a stone's throw away. That's awesome, Henry. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for sharing with the group. And so, uh, you know, very much like uh, like Rafa and 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 Krista, you know, uh, my background, the same thing. You know, I I I, I started uh, my career with Texas Parks and Wildlife, working at a state park down in, in the Rio Grande Valley at Benson State Park, and. Uh, um, before that, you know, I did a little bit of what Rafa did, you know, I, I volunteered here and there, um, did a little bit of work with uh, other uh, conservation agencies. Um, but thankfully, you know, my career, my, my path really led me to Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, I've always shared that interest um, of, of conserving our resources so that so that my kids are able to enjoy that down the road. And so um, I really, uh, I really enjoy uh, what I get to do now. Um, you know, the rest is history and, and, and looking into the future. There's so many possibilities that we can do, so many things that we can uh, continue to preserve our natural resources. Um, and so I'm super excited that all of you guys were able to share um, how you guys got to this point right now. Uh, and I can only say that the, the future looks very, very bright, uh, from, you know, hearing all these stories from you guys. Um, so you know, just to kind of um, jump into uh, another topic, you know, when I was growing up, um, <clears throat> you know, it was hard for me to, uh, as a kid in, in an elementary school, uh, that's when I really started to kind of see, um, you know, what I really wanted to do growing up. 
Um, you know, as a first generation Mexican American, my parents really worked outside. They did a lot of uh, manual labor outside. And so they really instilled, um, you know, hey, um, hey, Edwin, they, usually, they would call me Mijo. Mijo, hey, go ahead. You know, you need to go to college. You need to make sure that you get an education so they can get better and, and, and better yourself. And so some of my challenges uh, uh, growing up was there was not enough information out there um, for me to know, hey, you know, I can do this. I could be, you know, a doctor. I could be a lawyer. Uh, long and behold, you know, I, I love being a park ranger. I don't think I could ever go back. Um, and so, uh, you know, what challenges did y'all see growing up, if any, if you had any, that led you to your current role or your current position? Um, uh, and if, you know, if you did face any type of those uh, challenges, how did you kind of over, overcome those? Um, so uh, Diego, um, uh, you know, would you mind sharing that a uh, little bit of, of your, your path or any, any challenges that you might have had? Sure. So uh, for me, uh, probably very similar to many. Um, I grew up in a single parent household. Um, so obviously finances were, were always a challenge and um, very, very minimal oversight. Um, you know, my mom was just always working just to provide for us. Um, and we had, I had uh, three other siblings. So um, I was kind of growing up as self-sufficient, you know, um, but I think that that gave me a lot of drive um, in goal seeking. You know, I knew I wanted to go and finish um, high school and get my degree to, so I could have a, a successful lifestyle. And um, so I kind of drove myself to, to go to college and get my degree. And I think that even helped me um, even with Texas Parks and Wildlife, because um, I started like, like many of us, um, you know, at a very um, basic level as an operation ranger too in maintenance. And then, you know, after, and I was driven to, I gained a lot of experience throughout my, my journey. And um, I started at Bastrop State Park and then um, I promoted up to a Ranger 4 in maintenance. And then I, I got a, a lead Ranger or maintenance supervisor position at Mother Neff State Park. And then after that, a few years, I um, got the assistant superintendent position at Mustang Island State Park. And, um, and then I was there for a few years. And then, um, you know, um, the regional director asked if I would uh, do a, a interim uh, superintendent position at Resaca de la Palma down in Brownsville, which I did. And I loved it. I loved that. Um, just the area and, and the, the culture and the park. Um, and then... Um, and then after, after that, I went back to Mustang and then I uh, eventually got the superintendent position here at Choke. So I've been at several different parks and learned a lot to be able to um, equip me to be successful as a park superintendent, but also to, you know, to steward our, our resources and um, do what we're all trying to do is, is be successful at that for our current and future generations. So that's kind of the challenge that I had, but I really, you know, gave me those those skills to to be successful like Dale. That's awesome. Um, you know, it, that's the neat thing about working for 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 this agency, this conservation agency that, you know, it's it's such a big state that you really get to uh, experience those different areas, those different little niches in the state and 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 take that in. And I love Brownsville, the culture is so rich. And, you know, talk, you know, when we're talking about Rafa and the location where he's at, that's also a great location, you know, the, the terrain. And so it's really neat to, to kind of hear these different locations within, within the state. And so thanks for sharing, uh, sharing that uh, with us, Diego. Um, so Rafa, you know, I, I would, uh, you know, direct the same question to you. You know, did you have any challenges growing up, if any, or... Um, you know, leading up to this particular role. I know you briefly touched on that uh, early on. Yeah, so um, I've, had, I've had a lot of challenges uh, growing up uh, just to get in a position like this, uh, working in the outdoors. But I, I feel like um, challenges, that's just life. Everybody's going to have different challenges. I mean, it can be health challenges that you sometimes encounter that you weren't expecting. It can be uh, your household, uh, what people are expecting for you to do. Uh, so there can be many different ones, and I'm, I am going to speak about uh, my own one, so hopefully this resonates with some of the viewers. 
Uh, so uh, growing up, again, I'm, I'm first generation. I moved to the US when I was 12. So uh, pretty similar to Diego. I mean, uh, I had, I, uh, my dad was just the, the, the working man. He was applying for the whole family. My mom was a stay-at-home mom because she wanted to make sure that her kids were able to have the opportunities they deserved. Because oftentimes um, she saw that if two people work, sometimes the kids, uh, they're not giving as much attention. So thankfully my mom was there and she opened up a lot of doors for me. So I'm really grateful for that. But the challenges more came uh, from other people. Uh, I remember growing up in school um, and you all probably um, felt this growing up uh, with the counselors. Uh, I remember at a young age, uh, seeing the Rio, the Rio Bravo down here, the uh, Rio Grande. Uh, with no water, and I remember reading in books when you're teaching, you're like, oh, like rivers are supposed to have some water in them. So um, that's all they teach you. Like they don't teach you, like, oh, it can be seasonal or like, oh, they use for like agriculture. So so there's a lot of lack of knowledge. So um, based off of that, I will go to the counselors and my teachers and ask them, like, hey, I've heard like there's these positions where you can work outdoors, like you can be like a park ranger and be like in forest, like that sounds really cool. And they will always tell me like, oh yeah, those are really cool positions, but like they're really hard to get. So like right away when you're like in fifth grade uh, trying to go to college, they're telling you like, yeah, you can do it, but it's really hard. So they're that big challenge, right? They're like, ah, like maybe don't even try because it's going to be really hard. So uh, I just want to share to people to know to don't let that get you down. Um, I feel that as long as you have the passion for it, you're gonna do well. It's only when people are trying to get positions that they're not passionate about, that it's gonna be really hard for you to get. Yeah, it might take some time, uh, cause it's always gonna take time and effort to get to places. I'm sure Shelby knows, I mean, she was scared to apply to these different positions. Maybe she didn't think she was good enough, but I'm sure the interviewer saw her passion for it. I mean, you can just see it when she was talking about it, how she was passionate about it, it's something she wanted to do. So just know that there's going to be challenges like that all the time, and you're going to feel it all your life. I'm sure that you, Edwin, uh, you, Diego, when you are applying for your current position, you're like, I don't know, like, am I going to be the best applicant? Am I going to be the one getting there? Like, you're always going to feel like you're not enough, but just know that you never know until you try, and as long as you have that passion, uh, people are going to see it. And if you, even if you don't get it, just get value from those interviews, from that experience, and keep going. They're going to remember you. You're going to, you're going to be better prepared for that next time. Uh, so even if you don't get it once, always be active about it. Volunteer, uh, go talk to people, uh, go to places and do things. Uh, and remember, just don't lose that passion and keep going. Hey, thanks, Rafa. I think you nailed it right there. Um, you know, I can definitely relate to to what you mentioned in, in high school and middle school and, and talking to counselors. Um, you know, I originally wanted to uh, do something in law enforcement, but my passion was really always in, in outdoors, um, and, and teaching people how to, you know, hike, how to kayak. Um, I always really had that passion and I ended up, you know, switching gears and, and I went down the, the biology conservation side. And so, uh, like you mentioned, if you have that passion for it, um, you can, you can move mountains, you know, trying to get to, to your end destination. And so, um, I think you hit it, uh, you know, right there pretty good. Yeah. And um, it's never too caring. late. Yep. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> you know, usually when I reflect on these type of things and I always try to lend it uh, and, and give advice to to um, to anybody that will take the, the advice or they're asking me for advice. And, and the number one thing, and I think Rafa really also mentioned this uh, earlier on is, you know, and I always see myself as an example, you know, when I'm growing up and I'm, uh, and I was going through college or, or even earlier going through high school, um, a lot of the times I didn't know all these different uh, possibilities uh, or opportunities were available um, to, to, to be able to volunteer or to even just apply because like, like Rafa mentioned, you know, it, a lot of the times if you wanted to pursue a career in conservation or in biology, you know, it was very competitive, but also the number one thing that I would hear all the time was, it's really hard. It's really hard. Um, and so if you have that passion for that, uh, you know, that really doesn't matter. As long as you have that passion, you'll, you'll make it through. Um, and so I always wanted to reach out and give out some, some, some advice to folks that would, you know, kindly take it. And so if, 
if I were to go back in time and and give myself advice, or if you guys would go back in time and give yourself your younger you advice uh, about how you know you would do uh, a certain thing, or if you would do something differently um, that would help you get to the current role that you're currently in, what would that be? How would you give yourself advice uh, or somebody else uh, for that, for example? And so Shelby, would you mind sharing a, a little bit of that uh, perspective? Yeah, of course. Um, so honestly, when we got these questions, I thought about this a lot. I'm like, oh my gosh, what would I say to my younger self? And now being older, like and having a little bit more knowledge um, on life. Um, I feel like something I've done a lot throughout growing up is a lot of like self-doubt and um, wondering oh, oh, my dogs, um, if I am, you know, good enough for a position or is this really the career choice that I would, I want to, I want to go for, forward with. Um, it's just not to not to doubt yourself because um, everything happens for a reason and um, opportunities are always going to present themselves at the correct time in your life. Um, so just not to stress about the future and just continue in the present. That's awesome, Shelby. Thanks for sharing with us. Hey, Carolyn, how would you uh, give your younger you advice or anybody out there wishing to get some advice um, when it comes to, you know, potentially looking for a career in conservation or state parks? Sure. So when I was 14, I had the pleasure of serving as a Senate page at the Texas Capitol. And it sparked an interest in, of course, the legislative process and all that. Um, so I found out I didn't want to quit. That job ended, of course, at the end of the session, and I wanted to continue. So I just asked questions of people who had jobs that, you know, I could apply for. And that's the key here. Um, I see many of the, the panelists who reached out and asked me, how do I do this XYZ? How do I get from point A to point B at state parks? Make those connections. Ask questions. And one other thing is take a test drive try us out. You can be a volunteer. You can try an entry-level job. As I mentioned, um, getting experience in the administrative part of our park operations is key to um, growing and, and promoting with us. So even on the maintenance side, learning about our operations is going to help you. So don't be afraid to take an entry-level job. Um, you'll get hooked. People will help you. We have plenty of training and ways to advance. So all I do is encourage you to give us a test drive and start out as a volunteer, build that resume, make connections and uh, you'll you'll go far. That's awesome, Carolyn. You know, I, 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 I always have this really fond memory of meeting Carolyn for the first time. Um, and, you know, she just mentioned, you know, don't be afraid to take in a, uh, entry level job position. You know, my very first position with Texas Parks and Wildlife was as a regular maintenance ranger. One, you know, I had to, you know, help with all the operations and, you know, help, uh, you know, cleaning some restrooms and 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 taking care of of, of the day to day operations so that the visitors were having a a, a great time uh, when they're visiting state parks. And my very first time uh, meeting Carolyn was at a uh, kidfish event at Lake Corpus Christi. Uh, and uh, I'm like, hey, Carolyn. And so I think she touched it uh, in terms of ask questions, talk to people, network. Um, asking questions is always a, a best way to really get to know um, what what's out there and, and those different type of possibilities and and to really help you kind of guide you towards the uh, to that end, end career goal that, that you have in mind. And so thanks, Carolyn, for sharing that with us. Um, and so, you know, I always, um, bring this up when, when we do a lot of outreach events, uh, we go out to schools, we go out to, um, to these different, uh, tabling booths, um, in, in town. And, and we always see a lot of people coming and going from all different walks of life. And, and you know, 
the number one question that we get asked is, well, do I need to have a conservation degree to just work for Tech Sparks and Wildlife? Um, you know, my number one question uh, answer is no. You know, we, you know, any degree uh, will work. Uh, uh, you know, there's some positions out there that doesn't require a degree, um, but you know, every uh, every single uh, position out there has different uh, requirements. Uh, but we we certainly encourage people to apply because you don't necessarily have to have a conservation degree to to apply to work for Texas Portion Wallet. Um, and so uh, I guess the next question that I really want to pose to uh, to Krista is, um, you know, why do you think important uh, it's important to to have this diversity in the workplace? Yeah, so I think it's absolutely vital, especially in state parks. Um, because that's how our staff helps to connect with the majority of our visitors, right? So certainly while I try to make these connections with every single person that comes through, um, I don't necessarily have the background to connect with every single individual that comes through. Um, but I have worked at a park where there were several veterans on staff. And so the way that they connected with other veterans coming through the park was, was way more than I could have, but it lended to the experience of that camper. Um, or say somebody on the staff who was a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout, they can certainly connect with the Scout troops that come through on a different level. Um, so I think having a diverse staff, so not even diverse, not just diverse in gender, race, or um, anything of that nature, but also diverse in experiences, in backgrounds, that makes a huge difference, especially when you're the first face um, of the park when a visitor comes in. They want to be able to see themselves in you, in the staff, right? Because my hope is always that they'll go home and, and maybe somebody will say, hey, I saw a lot of veterans working at Palmetto State Park. Maybe I can I can apply and maybe I can get it. And, you know, like as long as they can see themselves and they make a connection, I think that we we promote that idea of inclusivity. Um, and and that's that's big to me. I, I really want people to be comfortable when they come to our parks and and to have that great experience when they're talking with us. You know. Yep. Yep. No, I think you, you said it just right. Um, thanks for sharing that with us, uh, Krista. Hey, Shelby. Uh, um, uh, would you mind um, just sharing your, your thoughts on this? You know, uh, why do you think it's important to have that diversity in the workplace? Yeah, so like Krista said, social diversity is like super important because not only is it about you know, gender and age and ethnicity, you're also needing those social similarities um, to be able to have these interpersonal relationships with um, the people that are coming to your state park super important um but going into a different aspect um like gender and age and um ethnicity i think that's so important too um for your staff to create bonds with each other um if we're not looking at like outside people just the staff i think it's so important because then you can create those relationships and you can bounce ideas off of um, other staff members who may have a different insight on something than you have um, just to create better problem solving skills um, and working better as a team in that aspect. Um, yeah. Yep, 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 absolutely, Shelby. Um, Diego, uh, would you mind sharing your, your uh, uh, thoughts on this? Sure. Um, you know, for me too, um, it, it's really important for us to to represent the the visitors and the population that we serve. Um, and obviously, uh, in Texas and America, you know, we are a very diverse um, people. And um, so there's that aspect. But what's also important is the workplace is a great opportunity for people to you know, who maybe have never met um, different people or different backgrounds, it's a great opportunity for them to have that experience with them. We're working with these people for eight hours of a day, and that's often more time than we spend with our family. And then that's where we have that opportunity to develop those relationships with, with other people, with other backgrounds, with other cultures. And then that helps us care and value for that person that we may not have ever met in our life without that opportunity. So I think that it's a great connecting place to to connect with um, 
uh, different people, not only at the workplace, but even the visitors, so our customers. Um, and it just, I think it helps us progress as an American, as a culture, um, to care and value everybody as a whole. And I think that's why it's really important. Yep. Hey, Rafa, do you have your, your hand up? Uh, you wanna uh, share your perspective on, on this? You might be a little bit mute right there. I got it, had my mouse somewhere else. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to also add in how diversity just in general is so important so important for innovation, uh, just because if everybody was just always the same, if everybody thought the same way, always did the same thing, I mean, everything's gonna stay the same. There's, we're never gonna keep going forward. And I, and, and I personally just experienced this by going to the, uh, to the um, state conference uh, just a few months back. Uh, and it was just a great experience because uh, just four months into the job, I was able to meet all of these great people. I met the artists that make all of the art for the, State parks. I made. I met the IT people that make sure that everything is running smoothly. Uh, I mean, I met the people that the architects that come up with the how our buildings are going to look and why it's important to make it look and fit uh, with your park itself. And without talking to these people, I mean, the vision. There's a lot of things that we just take for granted. That I mean, us by ourselves, the way we think, we just wouldn't be able to do them justice or as well as they could be. So. Uh, and just talking to those people, it just gets you excited about your park. I mean, I remember when I first came back, I was like, oh, I can I can make this new interpretive program. That was a really good idea. Oh, the person, this the way this person was talking, like, oh, like we can do this in my park this way. So again, just innovation and the excitement of something new, something different, that's always gonna be, uh, that's always gonna be the, make the workplace better. Yep, yep. No, you're absolutely right, and uh, you know even more so now, um, where we're we're seeing a lot more visitation in our parks. Um, you know, I think Krista uh, kind of touched on this a little bit. You know, it, it, for me growing up, it was hard for us to go to state parks. I always love outdoors. I, I love going hiking and camping, but my parents really didn't like doing that because they spent twenty, you know, almost. You know, more than eight hours a day working outside. And so that's probably the last thing that they want to do going to go camp. And so here's, you know, a little Edwin trying to come on, mom, dad, let's go, you know, let's go to this park or let's go here. Um, and so for, for my experience, you know, really uh, going to a, to a state park and having that connection with, um, you know, somebody that, that I could relate to, that was super eye-opening for me. And that's really when, when that seed got planted in me that, hey, I really want to be, uh, you know, a park ranger or work in that area of conservation so that we can, we, we can be stewards for these, these wild places that we have here in, in, in Texas. Um, so, uh, no, I think you guys, uh, you guys are right on track and, and it's great advice for everybody that's seeing uh, at home and, and tuning in to this, to this session because, you know, we always want to um, get these different advices and, 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 you know, as a younger me, I wish I had uh, a, a round table discussion uh, that I would have been able to see to, so that I could be able to, you know, have that, that idea, you know, light up. Um, so awesome responses are, uh, you know, that's great. Um, <clears throat> so if you guys, um, you know, if you guys wanted to promote any type of, uh, Hispanic heritage month, um, goals, um, how would that look like? You know, it could be personal, it could be professional, um, you know, to give me, to give you an example of what I really like to do is I, you know, when we go to church, um, I like to introduce new people that have never been out to a, to a state park. And that, that is my personal goal. I want to pass that on to new people, new users. Uh, and then professionally, I get to th do this um, as a job. You know, it doesn't feel like it's a job when I'm taking people out on, on, the, on their first kayak lesson. And, you know, I get to take a picture and say, hey, this is the view of my 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 view of my office this morning because uh, I really have that passion to to connect people to the outdoors and so 
Uh, those are some of my goals for, for promoting these outdoor op opportunities and even professional opportunities working for, for state parks. Um, so, Henry, would you mind just kind of giving us some of those thoughts and, and how, uh, you know, or if you have any type of goals uh, that you have for promoting these opportunities? Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, touching on like what you just said, um, any kind of social event, I'm always talking about the park. I'm, I'm super happy to be here. I mean, when you have a view like this to come out on your way out after work, you know, it, it's not too hard to like, you know, just fall in love with it. Um, and just the social aspect of it, it's every time we have a, a new park visitor and, you know, from the Latino background and they just, they seem lost and confused, you get that opportunity to just like, just promote everything that you can about why you love this position in this park. Um, and it half the time they're overly impressed or just overly enjoyed to be able to have someone to communicate and understand where they're coming from and just get some direction really. Um, and that's always part of the professional part. Uh, I know in our park, our interpreter has been very amazing about doing a few activities for uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. We did a nature loteria um, and we're having a few of those going on these weekend, these couple of coming weekends. Um, and, you know, we, I've talked to her about trying to like promote on our Facebook page, both in English and Spanish. So moving forward, that's going to be one of our big aspects of trying to just get the spread the word out so everybody understands and is included on our activities in our park. Yep. Yep. No, that's, that's awesome. And uh, I think, uh, um, you know, that's something very, very similar and kind of touching on, on, on my next question you know, how do we, how do we continue, uh, you know, at home or, or at work, you know, how do we continue with, with Hispanic, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month? Um, and so at our house, we really, you know, being a first um, generation Mexican American, you know, I really try to pass all that, that uh, the cultura, the, the tradiciones to, to my kids so that they can continue to pass that down to their kids. Um, and so I guess my next question, uh, Carolyn, will be directed to you. You know, how, how does uh, Hispanic Heritage Month mean to you? Um, you know, is there anything special that you do uh, either, you know, personally at home or maybe at work? Um, how, do, how do you celebrate that? So I just want to say that Hispanic Heritage Month means a lot more to me now that I work for Parks and Wildlife. Um, when I first started out and traveled, because we drive by car, right? Mostly we don't fly. Um, I get to go through a lot of towns near the parks that are predominantly Hispanic. And so say at Big Bend, you know, going through um, Presidio and and Lajitas or Terterlingua and um, up in the Panhandle by Caprock Canyon going through Tilden and Silverton. Those are places where my parent or my, my dad actually worked in the crops and picked crops. So then tying me back to the place where my dad was um, even at the coast down in Tilden or Sitton. Um, so it has really bonded me with my personal heritage and um, this Christmas, actually, our family reunion, we are going to bring items together from my family's past to show the newer generations what that was like. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to do is just bridge the gap between past generations to current generations. But the bond and the connection has really grown with Parks and Wildlife, just getting to be out there. So that's another thing. Um, Parks and Wildlife celebrates all cultures. But um, a couple of years ago, we had a cultural um, event where people introduced each other to our cultures. And so like Diego said, and it, we all try to form this connection and Hispanic Heritage Month means a lot more to me now working for Parks and Wildlife. Yep. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, um, uh, you know, uh, seeing all these different uh, backgrounds and cultural. You know, you know, Texas is a big state, and you know, going from the the Rio Grande Valley to to North Texas and these different locations where where I've been fortunate to work, 
um, it's great to really take in all that 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 culture in. Um, you know, I, I have really great memories. Um, I'm, I'm, I am a Valley native. Um, and so I, that's always going to be in my heart. But, you know, going up to North Texas, man, there is so, so much rich culture up there. Um, it's, it, you know, I can't, I can't uh, explain how, how different and diverse uh, it is. But, you know, we all celebrate a little bit different. And, and that's the neat thing about it. Um, so, um, how, um, you know, when we try, at least my personal goal is to really try to connect uh, a, a very diverse user group to to the park. And the only way I can I can try to do that, uh, or one of the ways that I can help uh, by doing that is, you know, using my culture and, and bridging, like Carolyn mentioned, bridging that gap between some of those user groups that come out to our state parks. Um, and so, you know, every now and then, you know, I have a, a program in Spanish and to try to bridge that gap and really get people engaged in the, in the resources that we have here. Uh, and so one of those that I really like to do is uh, Café con Vaqueros and uh, a bit of the way how they would, you know, um, uh, make their coffee in the mornings, uh, something very simple. But uh, obviously, I, you know, I, I speak Spanish. And, and so I had that connection with our visitors. Uh, so I guess leading up to this question is, um, how do you, uh, how do you bring your culture to the park? And do you, do you speak Spanish in the park? And so, um, uh, Krista, are you able to, uh, would you be able to share your, your, your thoughts on that? So, um, so I'm certainly not fluent in Spanish. I would not say that, but I can speak it enough to have conversations with the, the campers. Um, so I'm going to tell a story that sticks with me so many years later. So at Choke Canyon, we had a family check into the cabins one night and the dad came in and he brought his teenage daughter in with him. And um, so he was predominantly, like, all he spoke was Spanish. And so when he came in, he didn't realize that I also, I could understand him, I could speak with them, I could communicate. Um, he started talking to his teen daughter to tell me that they were checking in and explain all that. And she was just on her cell phone. She didn't want to hear it. She didn't want to help. Like she was, you know, in her own little world. Um, so I piped in and I told him in Spanish, I can understand, I, I'm certainly not fluent, but we can work through this. And his face just lit up. And so then I was able to help him through the process. It wasn't pretty, I wouldn't say it was like, you know, like we stumbled through some things. Um, but in the end, I was able to check him in and I answered all his questions. And um, so he left happy, all was good. And then two weeks later, he, him and his family came back again. And that second time he walked in by himself and he walked straight to me. And it was just like, that to me made it feel like I made a difference to this one camper. Like I made him feel comfortable enough to come in without his, his daughter, you know? And so um, that like, that's just one of my favorite memories because I was able to help somebody, you know? <laughs> It, it was an experience and um, he remembered me and I remembered him. And so, um, so I think it's important that we have at least somebody who can speak Spanish or somebody who can try, you know, because um, it, it does make a difference for the customer experience. So that was fun. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I think everybody probably has a, a great experiences like that where, you know, we, you know, Henry mentioned, you know, we love what we do. Sometimes we have really good uh, views, like, you know, he has a really good sunset view of Gravelston Island. Uh, but we also get these really good rewarding uh, experiences with our visitors when we make the, those connections and their lasting connections that, you know, year after year, they're coming back because, you know, you influence maybe a little kid or, or, uh, or even an adult, you know, that has never really been out to a, a state park and they were, they were, they felt welcome at that park uh, just because they were able to make that connection. And so that's, that's awesome. Um, so, you know, and I think I, I'll talk a little bit about this, but growing up, you know, my parents were always really big on, mijo, you need to get an education, you need to go to college. Um, so that you can better yourself. Um, and so that was always really in the back of my head, um, growing up, going through college. And so we, we knew, I knew that in my family, 
education was pretty important. And so I knew that I first had to get that done and then continue with the, the path that I wanted to go to. And so how important was education to you and your family growing up? Um, and, and, and was there any, um, was there any emphasis in in following a career in conservation? Um, so, uh, Shelby, would you mind, you know, if you have any of your perspective in that? Yeah, of course. Um, education was a major key in my growing up. Um, my grandmother actually was a bilingual teacher for over 30 years. Um, so she had her master's degree, she had her bachelor's, um, she has 10 siblings, um, so all of her older sisters, as well as herself, um, had master's, PhDs, and, um, bachelor's degrees, and all of them were nurses and, um, teachers, educators, um, college professors, um, so it, there was always a very big emphasis on college and getting a higher education. Um, so that was something I always knew I wanted to do. Um, I also have a very young mom. Um, so she had me and my grandmother was very, very supportive and let her go to college at Texas Women's University um and didn't and I stayed and lived with my grandmother until she finished her college degree um so it, there was always a very big emphasis on it but when it comes to conservation that was never um never really a career choice that was ever brought up I always knew that I loved the outdoors um I loved wildlife and animals um so I always thought oh you know the only career choice I have is being a veterinarian like no no big deal that makes sense yeah so um I had gone all these years thinking yeah I'll I'll go into veterinary medicine and I'll I'll do that um and then I got into my higher level biology courses and so like herpetology ecology all of those great classes and I loved it um and I was like this is absolutely what I want to do I love being out in the field I love doing this kind of stuff um, so they were all still very confused <laughs> about what conservation necessarily was. Um, they, it was never really a big career choice in their, in their mind, but they're all very supportive of it. So, um, yeah, education was a, a key in my growing up. So that's, that's awesome. And I, I can relate to that. Uh, you know, my, my mom still kind of, she knows I work in conservation and in, in, in state parks. Um, but, uh, you know, she still can't comprehend, you know, because we used to spend a lot of time outdoors manually working, you know, and it, it was, uh, but she's happy. She, you know, she loves, she knows that I love what I do and, and, and it's, it's great. Um, so Rafa, would you mind sharing your perspective? You know, uh, how important was education to you and your family and, uh, uh, and how important was it to follow a career in, in, in conservation? Yeah, so uh, education was uh, really important in my family. Uh, my grandparents, actually, um, I believe my, my grandmother didn't only made it up to the third grade. So she was barely able to read and write a little bit. And my grandfather, actually, he did not know how to read and write. And it was after he, uh, it was after he married my grandmother that she taught him how to uh, read and write. So, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing how far uh, my family has come in uh, just uh, one, two generations. Um, for my mom's generation, uh, I remember my mom always tell stories about my grandmother. Uh, it was pretty similar. My, my, my grandmother just stayed at home, uh, make sure that there was always food on the table for 14 kids, food on the table for 14 kids while uh, my grandfather worked. Uh, he, was, uh, he built houses with no math degree, like not going to school. So, uh, so that's just something that has to say about the Hispanic heritage that we're always, I mean, you know about the, 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 uh, the Hispanic uh, ingenuity, like we're, we're always coming with new ways to do things. Uh, we, we, we don't follow like the, the like, oh, like, no, this is how you're supposed to do it. Or like, I mean, 
So anyway, I feel like uh, us as Hispanics, we have a rich culture of uh, education, not necessarily the traditional education where you like go to school, it's more of like doing things. But anyway, I digress, I could talk about that. <laughs> That's going into a whole different direction. But uh, anyway, yeah, as, as you can tell that uh, my grandmother instilled education, my mom towards us instilled education. Um, but the, the thing that um, kind of what you have all alluded to is that, uh, yeah, there's education, but uh, I feel like the general education, or at least in the governments, they're emphasizing, they don't really emphasize uh, environmental education. And I feel like that's really, that's really sad and something that we need to uh, retake. Um, just because, as, as you were saying it, when like you I just just like you, I talk to my parents, I talk to my to my cousins, to my uncles, and tell them like, oh, I'm a park ranger. And they're like, oh, so you like you're like out in like forests and stuff. And I live in a desert. So <laughs> so like they don't even make that connection that like, well, there's no forest. I'm out in the desert and they just think that I'm like hiking out all the time. So which which we do hike, but like I feel like there's a, we do a lot of other things that are more important, like conserving the place, especially here in the Franklins, uh, erosion is really big and uh, we're trying to hold it together. So I feel that uh, at least education wise is really important to the family, but uh, I want to talk a little bit more of why it's important for us to be here and for us to educate people that come here because people just come and they want to hike, they just want to come in and take the view, which is a great first step. It is up to us uh, to educate them more to like make them understand why it's not just cool to like go hike and why it's actually important to take care of these places and why it's important to uh, restore them just because of, of all the valley that comes out of it, like all of the water that comes here goes into the Rio Bravo, the Rio Grande. And if we don't conserve it, that's that's going to be gone. It's going to be worse uh, in the future. Um, so yeah, ed education is really important both uh, in my family and I feel that uh, we're doing uh, a really special job here uh, being rangers uh, to educate other people since it's kind of lacking the traditional education. Yep, yep. No, that's that's exactly right. Um, you know, you mentioned that there's um, so many so many things, so many uh, pieces to the puzzle and, and the things that are happening behind the scenes to really have a, uh, you know, these phenomenal uh, uh, landscapes and, and state parks. You know, every single person out there has a really unique and key role to, to really help promote that, that um, you know, that stewardship and and have those places for for these future generations to really enjoy and so um you know thanks to Krista you know uh, you know being an assistant superintendent at Lake Corpus Christi uh Carolyn uh you know being at the uh, director for st uh, staff services at the headquarters you know Shelby you know I, I love hearing stories like uh, from Shelby as state park ambassadors I know a lot of uh, uh, state park uh, colleagues that started their careers as state park ambassadors. So that's it's always neat to, to kind of to, to see and, and hear that those type of stories. Um, you know, Henry um, always making those connections with people that are coming in through through the park headquarters at Galveston Island. I think uh, there's always going to be that one person that's going to remember and and have that connection, and they'll be going back after uh, you know year after year. Um, um, so it's great. Um, so I guess we have just reached uh, our our uh, our time. Uh, it looks like we have uh, wrapped up our Hispanic Heritage Month uh, panel discussion. We really appreciate everybody joining today and just having a just sincere uh, conversation with each other. Um, if there is if there's no uh, questions to uh, to any of the the members of the panelists. Uh, please feel free to uh, if you're if you're watching from from home or, or somewhere and, and you want to reach anybody uh, from from the panelists, uh, feel free to send in your information. We'll get you in contact with those folks. Um, and, and it's great to ask questions. Hey, how you know. Tell me a couple of tips. How did you get to this current role? What advice can you lend um, to my you know my. 13 year old uh, son or daughter that wants to pursue a career in conservation or in state parks. Um, we're here for that. Um, and, and please be able to reach out to anybody out here uh, in this panel um, and, and just ask questions. Um, 
So with that being said, we we will go ahead and wrap up uh, today's discussion. And I really want to thank everybody for joining us today. I, I also want to thank our our, uh, our uh, Luisa, which is our uh, technical assistant on the backgrounds. Uh, thank you so much for helping us with this. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. So uh, with that being said, hasta luego. We'll see you guys uh, down the road again. Adios. Adiós.